What's up, movie losers? Lindsay here, and tonight I am finishing the last of my dogfish head beer to drink music to. So we gotta make this one count. Um, tonight on the Moss Eisley Happy Hour, I'm gonna do things a little bit differently. And instead of just going through one book and doing our typical review, we're actually gonna look at the Aftermath trilogy by Chuck Wendig as a whole. Um, the plot in these books actually aren't really that important. This is after the destruction of the second Death Star in Return of the Jedi, and it shows this rebel group coming together and hunting down some high-ranking Imperial officers. Those officers are trying to reset the Empire or find a replacement for Emperor Palpatine. So the plot itself was okay. Weird style of writing. Overall, I would give the first book a two or a three out of five. The second and third books though are much better. The characters come together much more fluidly, but these books are still really important. And that's because it's gonna change how you look at everything in The Force Awakens. And I would imagine the next two movies coming out. We actually start here 30 years before the events of the book take place. There's a nice little prelude. It takes place 30 years before Return of the Jedi, though. So we obviously know that there's some significance to this planet, even at the time of the Clone Wars. So 30 years ago, we're on this planet, and Sheev Palpatine, who at the time is the Chancellor, is there. And he's actually drilling into the planet core secretly. No one knows he's there, no one knows it's Palpatine, but he meets this orphan boy, Gallius Rex. He asks this kid to guard the construction of this site for as long as it takes. So this little orphan boy on Jakku ends up killing people and just keeping this entire project a secret for Palpatine. Years later, Palpatine comes back and says he's done drilling takes the kid off planet. Now we start to find out a little bit more about why Palpatine was there. So we learn that this might be where the dark side started. Palpatine heard a voice calling to him. So we can assume that it might be Snoke. It might be Snoke from the unknown regions or from the planet core. But there was some voice calling Palpatine to drill this hole into the core of Jakku. So now we flash forward 30 years to the present day in this book, and that's right after Return of the Jedi. Emperor is dead, Darth Vader is dead, Gallius Rex swoops back into the story. So we know he was an important part of the Empire, but he was always kept hidden and kept secret, and no one really knows who he is or what he wants. So over the course of the books, we learn that Palpatine actually drilled what he called an observatory into the planet. And it seems like if something happened to him, Gallius Rax would then be responsible for rounding up the rest of the high-ranking Imperial officers and destroying the entire galaxy. Palpatine believed that without him, without the Emperor, the galaxy should never exist. So clearly this Jakku Observatory played some part in it. Gallius Rax does everything he can. He follows his plan. But by the end of this, he's actually killed before he can follow it through. Um, so he dies, clearly the galaxy survives. But it's really what we learn um, about this observatory. So we still don't have all the answers. But some questions this raises, what exactly did happen at Jakku thousands of years before this? Was it the origin of the dark side? Was this where Snoke was born? But clearly something happened, and a lot of people who worship the Force saw this as some kind of pilgrimage. And that's where Lor Santeca is in the beginning of Force Awakens when we meet him. So my personal thought is he is guarding Rey in some way, whether you think he's Rey's father or not. I do think he's responsible for guarding her. And I do also think he is responsible for keeping the wrong people away from this observatory. Um, in other source material, for example, Ray's survival guide, 
We do know that there are groups of people who guard the entrance of this observatory. No one knows what's under there. Some people think they're crazy, but there's still something there and there's something going on. So I think we're gonna go back to Jakku, not in The Last Jedi, but in episode nine. Um, so these are just some questions to keep in the back of your mind for when we do. So when Force Awakens first came out, I think most of us just assumed it might be pretty cut and dry with who the First Order was. Just some Imperials left over, Imperial worshippers who regrouped and came back to take their rightful place back in the galaxy. As we now know, a lot more goes into this. So there are a few key play players in the creation of the First Order. First one is Gallius Rex. He is the one to bring together all of these high-ranking Imperial officers. One of them is Admiral Ray Sloan. So she's a character who we know really well from a couple different uh, comic books, and she's in A New Dawn by John Jackson Miller. So we already know her. We've seen her trajectory, and she just comes back and is this kick-ass character in this one, too but she is dead set on keeping the Empire as powerful as it ever was without stopping. So her and Rex kind of butt heads in the best way to do that. One way they do start to bring the Empire back into its former glory is by pulling in Brendel Hux. Now Hux I'm sure sounds familiar to you and this is General Hux, his father. Um, so Brendel had a bastard son, bastard ginger son, he hated him, he was abusive to this kid, just kicked the crap out of him. Um, but the three of them are really responsible for trying to bring the Empire back to its former glory. Now Brendel Hux thinks the best way to do this is by starting an army of children, because he believes the only way you're gonna get your solid footing back is by starting with kids and just grooming them to be this merciless army. So sure enough, he starts to kidnap kids throughout the galaxy to form this vicious army. The best way I could think to describe it is the kindergartners in recess, but with Star Wars weapons. Um, so the three of them are working together but over the course of the books, there's these differences, and finally it comes down to Ray Sloan versus Gallius Rax. Ray Sloan wins, and she leaves with Hux and Hux's kid. Hux's bastard kid is now head of this army. So he is the commander in chief of these savage kids who we actually see in these really brutal graphic scenes how merciless they are in killing people. But they all go, they take this army into the unknown regions. Now this is important because it ties into a lot of other things that we're seeing in the new Star Wars canon. If you read Thrawn or checked out our review on Thrawn, that's when certain Imperial officers start to go to the unknown regions. Now in Aftermath, we find out that more and more have slowly been going to these regions for some reason. Palpatine heard a voice calling to him. So we can assume that Snoke was in the unknown regions calling to Palpatine and Palpatine already started sending soldiers over. So now our survivors, this little motley crew with their army of kids go in and they find like a super star destroyer filled with people ready to restart the empire. We don't know who those people are, we don't know what species they are, and we don't know how they plan on coming back later on. We do start to see more of that in Bloodline, so I would recommend checking out our video on that book. But regardless, we now have a few main players in the First Order. So I'm gonna be really interested to see what happened between the time they leave and the time they come back, and who's really in charge, because I don't know who Snoke would have picked of that group um, to eventually groom Hux and groom Kylo Ren into leading this army. For now, we're gonna focus on who I believe are the origins or the founders of the Knights of Ren, and that is the Acolytes of the Beyond. So the way this book is set up, 
there is that main plot over the course of three books, but we also get these breaks and these interludes. And that takes us to smaller stories, and some of those stories will connect or have recurring characters. One set of those interludes are the Acolytes of the Beyond. So when we first meet them, these are pretty much younger kids who worship Darth Vader, and in some regard believe that he might actually still be alive. So they start off small, they go around different planets spray painting things like Vader lives, um, maybe some small assaults here or there, but they then take a turn and become almost this terrorist organization. And they'll start to stage massacres. And really it's a distraction because what they're doing is going in and breaking into different museums and different vaults to steal highly prized Sith artifacts. Mostly they're looking for masks, which really important we'll get into, or the red lightsaber that they end up with. Now, I believe that this might be Darth Vader's lightsaber. Um, regardless of who it is, they clearly worship any kind of Sith, and especially Darth Vader. Uh, what's interesting about this, though, is even though we can assume they're not Force-sensitive, once they put on a mask of an ancient Sith, they become totally consumed by by the dark side. So we see one character who is really just there with her friends. She's not totally committed to the cause yet, and she doesn't really want to take that big a part of it. But as soon as she puts that mask on, she just goes crazy, and she even turns and just kills the friend who recruited her right then and there. Um, so these guys really, we can assume, continue that trajectory and continue that turn for the worse. Um, the reason I think they might be the Knights of Ren, though, is because of those masks that they wear. So even in Legends and what we've seen before, masks are a really important part of Star Wars and a really important part of the Sith. So I would assume that they take this hero worship and just continue until finally Kylo Ren, who we find out in Bloodlines, just found out he's Darth Vader's grandson. I think he's going to come in and take over this group and form them then into the Knights of Ren because the belief system is already there, the brutality is already there. It would really just be a name change. Now, why that name has changed, I would actually agree with Thor Skywalker's idea that Ren is actually a Skywalker family name. Maybe he was the first Skywalker, he played some kind of important role. Um, but I think Knights of Ren are the Acolytes of the Beyond. So just something to look out for in The Last Jedi, because we're going to see more of them. And then, of course, the final battle, the Battle of Jakku. We've all seen in The Force Awakens, the Star Destroyer, or the AT-AT that Rey lives in. That all comes because of this final battle. So when Gallius Rax is trying to blow up the galaxy, Last of the Rebels, Last of the Empire, they all come and they make their final stand here. When it was time to put this into motion, Gallius Rex started rounding up all the top Imperial officers, and he takes all these Sith artifacts, goes to Jakku, and he's now going to try to blow up Jakku, destroy what's left of the Empire, destroy what's left of the Rebellion, and God only knows what else. So obviously... He's not successful in that. He ends up dying before the plan takes place. So why is this important? Well, now we know a lot more about the Emperor's plans and what he wanted for the galaxy, which is total destruction. Um, but really, this is going to tie into the plot of Battlefront 2, the video game coming out in November. We can also start to see this in the comic book Shattered Empire. But there are still a lot of questions raised by this contingency plan. So what exactly is Jakku? Why would that hold the key to being able to destroy most of this galaxy? Um, there's also this voice calling to Palpatine in this contingency plan from this planet. So who is it? Is it Snoke? Is it from the unknown regions? As a whole, uh, the contingency plan just shows the complete brutality of the Sith, and they only want destruction. Um, 
So I do think it's interesting to take note of. I don't think it's going to be a main plot point in any way in anything we're going to see after Battlefront 2. But if you're interested in that video game, definitely make sure you're caught up to speed on the events of the Aftermath trilogy. <laughs> Do it.